Okay, so actually I am going to go, uh, go ahead and start and just open the event since um, I'm just going to give you a brief introduction. I would like to welcome everyone here and then I will give the platform to our wonderful speakers and, um, and hopefully by then everybody will he be here in the webinar room. So first of all, um, hello, uh, my name is Anika Osic. I'm Anika Osic. I'm a postdoctoral associate and lecturer in the program of Russian, East European and Eurasian Studies at the Macmillan Center at Yale. I am a co-organizer, co I'm sorry, and moderator of this event. And I would like to start, of course, by thanking, first of all, Yale World Fellow Sylvia Gregorsik Ibram for co-organizing this event. She's also on our panel today. Um, <clears throat> also Molly Brunson, who is the faculty director of RIST, and program coordinator Christina Andreides for providing us with her full support and technical knowledge for this event. Hopefully it will all go well. Um, perhaps many of you know that the authoritarian governments of Poland and Hungary in recent years have launched a full attack on local LGBTQ communities. There are two front lines uh, through which the leaders of the Hungarian Fidesz and the Polish Law and Justice Party have set out to dehumanize, silence, and delegitimize the LGBTQ people through legislation and through a campaign of hate and ideological brainwashing. In this panel today, we will discuss both of these processes. We will have a brilliant group of panelists, and I really would like to thank all of you for joining us. We are truly honored. Who will tell us about both the legislative measures implemented against the LGBTQ community and the different ways in which artists and activists attempt to subvert the hate campaign and change the public's perception of community. So briefly, our plan for uh, this afternoon or for this evening, depending on where you're watching us from. First, we'll start by each panelist who will just tell us a little bit about their professional, civic or private connections to the LGBTQ movement in uh, Poland or in Hungary. And, and they will provide us with a little bit of a context, uh, specifically what is happening in the region, since some of you might not be that familiar with local events. Then we will proceed uh, with a general uh, panel discussion to address some of the important questions that have arisen in the conversation. And in the end, we will have a Q&A. And our plan is to conclude this session by 2.15 p.m. in Eastern time or 8.15 p.m. Central European time. Um, so thank you again, and we'll start the individual short talks with Bart uh, Staszewski. Let me uh, quickly introduce Bart Staszewski. So Bart grew up in Lubin, East Poland. Uh, uh, Bart is a Polish LGBTI plus activist and the documentary film director. In 2017, he produced a documentary film, Article 18. It is the most important documentary to date on the LGBTQ struggle for equality in Poland. He is fighting in courts with Polish homophobic right-wing politicians and media. His up-to-date most important project is an artivist project called The Zones, in which he travels to self-acclaimed LGBT-free uh, zones, which we will tell you more about, and make photos with, this, with his own sign on site. He also invites the project uh, to the project LGBTQ people living there. In 2020, Bart was selected to be an Obama leader. He was also among Bloomberg uh, Business Week's Wants to Watch 2020 list. And in February 2021, he appeared on the Time 100 Next 2021 list of emerging leaders shaping the future by American news magazine Time. Bart, go ahead. Uh, thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, the, I want to underline that there is a lot more uh, of the activists uh, fighting on the field in Poland. Uh, I'm very happy that I was recognized, but of course there's a big effort and big fight ongoing here in Poland. And yes, myself, I am connected to two associations, Love Does Not Exclude Association, which is fighting from many years for the equality in Poland, mainly for the marriage equality, which is of course very hard with this new government, and the, the, the Lublin one, which is based in my hometown in Lublin, where we are mainly organizing the Pride Parade, mainly organizing a psychological hope uh, for, for the people. And, in my work, I connect the two spheres, two things. I mean, my videographic talent and uh, uh, activism. And I, I see through the pictures, through the moving pictures and how we can uh, move the people's hearts uh, and uh, highlight the, the problems we feel that are very important to say. Uh, and this is what I am doing since like six years, I think, since, since my documentary, Article 18, which was about the Polish constitution. 
mainly Article 18, which says that marriage is a union between the men and women, and so it's protected by a state. Dot, uh, and so uh, many politicians in Poland use it as an excuse to not uh, even touch the subject of the equality in Poland. And since the law and justice came into the power, so the current go ruling government, many things has changed the worst. We became the public enemy number one. Uh, now I think the public enemy are the migrants from Polish border, but, but for the many years, who was the first one. And then uh, our reality was the nightmare, actually. When we see, when we hear uh, the Polish politicians, top politicians like the P President Duda, the Prime Minister Morawiecki accusing us of being enemies, accusing us of, of being a, a, some kind of LGBT ideology. Uh, so we are fear, we are in a fear in our own country and we are actually feeling as a second category citizens. So our fight, our struggle uh, is really uh, happening right now. And since 2019, I think when there was the, the worst, uh, uh, the worst fight for equality and the worst uh, uh, propaganda against the LGBT people uh, that never occurred before. That was the first time in our democracy. So obvious that the government is against us. Uh, we feel that our stonewall is ongoing, actually. And we actually, I, I, I really think that we are winning. Uh, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It needs to happen. But I also feel that we have a lot of uh, people supporting us. Uh, it's an unequal war because we have the whole enemy, which is the government, which is the public propaganda, public TV, which is against us. Uh, they are using all of the democratic tools that we was thinking that are granted uh, against us and uh, or also suing us. So when I mix those all things, I maybe you should start with that we in Poland don't have any kind of uh, LGBT rights in the base of the marriage equality, civil union recognition, uh, hate speech law, they are not here. So you can say whatever you want about the LGBT community and you will never be prosecuted for that. And this is the biggest struggle, I think, because now we hear the, the, the horrible statement made by the Catholic Church officials, by the, the politicians from the party. I could, I could remind the, 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 the statement made by the, the most recognizable uh, Archbishop Jindraszewski, a Catholic priest, uh, that says that, uh, that 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 said that uh, we need to fight with the uh, red plaque, which was the communism. Now we need to fight with the rainbow plaque, which he meant the LGBT people. And I think that this is our daily basis right now. Uh, that on the one side we have the top leaders for the Catholic Church, for the right wing movement. On the other hand, we are alone. Uh, we have some support of, from the politician but we don't have the same tools. Uh, Polish TV just got 2 milliard złotych. Uh, it's just about half, mil half 500 uh, millions of euro uh, for the propaganda. Uh, and they are the worst thing ever. We can imagine that the communism uh, era in Poland had the very bad TV. Now we have the same uh, or even worse. Uh, and they uh, are making dis disgusting reports about the Polish people, Polish LGBT people comparing us to the pedophiles or even worse. Uh, and this is the daily basis. Uh, so it's very hard to teach the society, very, uh, very hard to change the society when they are constantly brainwashed by the TV, constantly brainwashed by the politician whom they can trust sometimes. Um, and uh, we are shown as some kind of a pu public enemy. Uh, people who want to came for their uh, kids, who want to change their life of style, who are some foreign agenda, who want now to change everything in Poland, which is of course not true. But those people don't have tools to recognize this fake agenda in public TV and to dismantle those horrible manipulations and propaganda. So myself, a few days ago, I was accused of the, from the president of Poland who was giving an interview to the Latvian TV uh, of being the most radical and the most uh, aggressive activist in Poland, which is of course uh, another lie, but it also gave me some, uh, uh, some, 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 to thinks to think that uh, they are very scared of us. They are really scared of the LGBT activists. They see that they're actually losing this uh, this battle. They know that they can, of course, 
make another law that will be the same like in Poland, the, the, the same like in Hungary, which will ban us from visibility, which will ban us from showing uh, on, the, on the street. They of course know that it will mean that we will even more go on the streets, even more protests, and we will create our civil, civil disobedience protests. So what, they, what more they can do? They just lost this young generation. They cannot brainwash them. They just can count on those old voters who are the most dev devoted voters for the law and justice. And this is what, what they actually are doing. Uh, the, 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 they are focusing on those most radical voters because the young generation that grow up on the Netflix, VODs, they don't buy this propaganda. They don't see young people, their fellow friends as demons. Uh, they don't see that they are some kind of enemies or whatever. Uh, so, and those people will in two years vote. They will have the right to vote. Now they are 16, 17. Uh, and the, this is the, my, my biggest hope that they will change this horrible situation. Uh, on the other hand, what the government is doing uh, is creating political lawsuits against the politi political enemies like activists. Myself, I got free lawsuits for, for my uh, activism. I, as you told before, I created a yellow sign with the text LGBT free zone. Uh, and, I go, I, and I went to the places that declared to fight with the LGBT ideology, which uh, has the common name LGBT free zones. Uh, those places declare with, the, the, with those acts around 40 places in Poland. Uh, and myself, I, I just felt that I need to do something, that we are not some kind of an ideology. We need to, uh, and, I need, and I needed to, I wanted to show that this is a very horrible lie and propaganda that want to dehumanize us. And uh, they really mean us, not some kind of an, an ideology. They even underline it in the interviews, just saying that they're an, an, an ideology for them. I mean, politicians were saying that an ideology for them mean two men, two women holding the hand in public, wearing the rainbow back in public, holding the pride parade in the city. Those things are the ideology for the politicians. And therefore they created the statements against LGBT ideology where they want to fight with the World Health Standards, with the homo propaganda, when, where, where they want to defend the uh, Christian families. It was one pagers that they was uh, creating in the, uh, on the local level uh, of, of, of the local administrative level. So I created this yellow sign. I went to those places. I hang it under the name of those cities who declare with those horrible acts and simply posted it on the Facebook and it went viral because it was deeply what they was uh, meaning and this was deeply moving the people's hearts. Uh, and for that, free municipalities suit me because they felt that they are not homophobic, they're not against people, they are just against ideology. It's their, it's, it's their explanation. And uh, who is representing them? They're, they are represented by the NGO called uh, Anti-Defamation League which is actually very connected to the Polish government. The head of this NGO is at the same time a member of board of the Polish press agency, which is 100% of Polish treasury. They are also responsible for the, it's the big, biggest Polish press agency in Poland, or Polish press and agency. And so they are also responsible for creating press releases uh, to the all media outlets in Poland. So they are actually uh, responsible for the propaganda. And it's, again, very hard to, to fight with them as they are holding the old propaganda in their own hand. Uh, this guy, Maciej Firski, who is the head of, the, of this NGO, collected the money for those municipalities and now, are, and now are fighting with me in the court. This is the slap case, of course, strategic lawsuits against the public participation. They want to intimidate activists. I'm not the only one. Other activists also got some lawsuits. The friend of mine got seven of them. Uh, from the municipalities uh, represented by the most radical, most fundamentalistic NGO called Ordo Iuris. Uh, so we are on the fight with the government because by behind those NGOs are big, big, big money from the government, usually, not always, um, and a big connection with the government, mostly, uh, because those people who are in those NGOs, they go there, they left, leave those NGOs, and then they're they are closely working with the with the government. So this is very unequal war, very unequal fight where we some some where we get some help from the uh, from the European Commission, which is supporting us by the statements 
uh, I could remind the first statement of the Ursula von der Leyen, the head of the European Commission, that said that, said that the LGBT free zones are the zones free from the humanity. And after that, many things happen, like the, the most important for me is the European strategy for equality. Uh, and many promises to make like the, the promise of making the visibility of the uh, rainbow parents in one country that they should be also visible in the other countries the legislation should go through this uh, and this is the thing that i should uh, that i see as a very big promise of hope for the future of europe on the other hand, there are also other things that are happening, like the... Uh, sorry, Bart, um, yeah? let's, I'm sorry for interrupting, I really don't want to interrupt you, but let's sure. just stop here for a second, because you've provided with us with such a rich context, and we're going to touch upon so many of the themes and issues that you've already uh, raised. So why don't we just continue now with Agnieszka, and then we're going to come back to the question of the EU, definitely the question of visibility, the Hungarian law. So this was actually... a really great opening so thank you so much and we and we would i personally would love to hear more about also your experiences going to those villages and holding up the signs so so we'll we'll touch up on all of these topics but uh, now i'm going to ask uh, agnieszka holland to talk a little bit and let me introduce her too so agnieszka holland is a polish film and television director and screenwriter she's best known for her political contributions to polish cinema holland is one of poland's most eminent filmmakers Holland is best known for her films Europa Europa or Europe Europe, for which she received an Academy Award for Best Adapted Screenplay nomination, as well as Angry Harvest and the, and the Holocaust drama In Darkness, both of which were nominated for the Academy Award for the Best Foreign Language Film. In 2017, she received the Alfred Bauer Prize, which is the Silver Bear, for her film Shapur at the Berlin International Film Festival. In 2020, she was elected the president of the European Film Academy, and she's also doing a very important work in LGBTQ activities. Thank you, Agnieszka. Uh, thank you. But I think that Bart was um, so clear and eloquent in explaining the situation that I have um, only very few things to add. And I am representing not the activists, I am uh, the supporter of the fight of LGBT community and the other fights as well. The fight for, um, for the state of law, for the judiciary, um, for the freedom of speech, uh, freedom of media, um, for everything. And now in the, in the, in the last weeks, uh, when the um, migrants are, um, on Polish, uh, Belarusian border uh, are practically killed by the um, very cruel pushbacks, uh, I'm, 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 I'm acting in their behalf as much as I can with my speech and with my with my films. Um, I did several films which um, uh, were not activists but um, presented um, the homosexual homosexual relationship and what was always important to me. Um, as much in um, those movies, like in the movies touching, uh, touching Holocaust, it's uh, to uh, present uh, the people who are persecuted or who are in the um, op oppressive situation, not on as a victims only, but as a full human beings, um, not better and not worse than any other human being. It means to build up the empathy and the interest um, through um, uh, aiming at their humanity more than their status of victims. And I think that the um, young um, LGBT community in Poland exactly is fighting for the same. Uh, they are fighting for the basic rights, uh, basic human and citizen rights, of course, but they are fight, fighting also for uh, the right to be themselves, uh, for the um, identity which, um, which is not judged uh, by any means. Uh, I was, I was um, the government, um, uh, the government which is ruling Poland right now, is a typical and atypical in the same time, populist, uh, right-wing, um, Catholic nationalistic government, with the very strong authoritarian um, string. And um, uh, they need, 
in order to rule the country and to win the election, they need the figure of the enemy, the scapegoat. Um, in the 19, uh, 2015, when they won the first time the elections, um, the parliamentary elections, um, it was the migrants, it was the wave of, um, of migration uh, in Europe um, um, due to the Syrian war. And they won, uh, raising this kind of the, of the fear and hate very efficiently and very quickly, using um, the language which I can clearly call the Nazi language, because they've been uh, using the language uh, uh, which uh, they humanized um, this group of the people. Uh, and uh, it was uh, Islamophobic, of course, but it was more than that. It was to create the fear that somebody terrible will come and um, um, rape our women and um, bring some disease and uh, make our children the victims of some terrible violence. Uh, the same after it was judges, but um, LGBT um, uh, helped them to win the elections twice. It means using the hate language and the, the creating this, uh, this um, uh, figure of the enemy um, uh, called LGBT um, ideology. And uh, using this word ideology, it was not only in order to um, dehumanize um, the people, but also to, uh, to, to have some kind of the excuse in front of the European Union or in front of the, of the tribunals uh, saying we are not attacking people, we are attacking the ideology, which is something very vague and non-existing, by the way, I think. Uh, in this moment, when it happened, um, I decided that we decided with some friends that we have to do something to help, uh, because what, what we feel um, during the last six years is the feeling of the powerlessness. The feeling that uh, the things are happening and that uh, the propaganda is so efficient uh, that it's very difficult to, to, to imagine that um, uh, this kind of the hate speech and this kind of the um, governance can, uh, can lo lose. That, um, uh, that um, we have to do something to, to touch the public opinion in our small tools. And also um, to help the organizations and LGBT organizations are several activists and several NGOs, which are really great, I think, and um, working very hard and having the great projects and the um, great activity. Uh, and the um, thing they are missing are money. Um, so we decided with um, some friends of mine, including um, Olga Tokarczuk, who is a um, uh, Polish um, recipient of a um, uh, uh, Nobel and Booker Prize for Literature, and, um, uh, some other women, to some um, international lawyers to create the um, foundation um, called uh, Equiversity. Uh, which is some kind of the you know game of words, uh, and um, and to collect money as much as we'll be able using some ideas and some connections and some um, some medias um, uh, to to collect the money, which then we can uh, we can transfer to um, the organizations which are existing on the on the Polish ground um, and which are working very hard. So that was our main uh, main goal to 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 use our visibility or some kind of the of the connections to uh, to help financially and in the same time, of course, uh, I was trying as much as I was able to to use um, existing media and existing um, uh, existing um, uh, means to uh, speak about the situation, uh, which, by the way, um, costed me also the lawsuit, which I'm awaiting now the trial with the same organization, but to mention the um, uh, Ordo Juris, which is uh, the branch of international um, religious um, extreme right um, organization connecting also connected also to I don't want to tell it now because I I, I don't want to add the um, arguments to the uh, to to my to my um, accusation. 
Thank you, Agnieszka, for giving such a great cue for Sylvia speaking about the, the court trials and the legal cases, because uh, many of these are represented by Sylvia, who's also on this panel today. So let me quickly introduce her. Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Gregorczyk Abram is an attorney at law and social activist working with NGOs on developing a democratic civil society and protecting the rule of law in the Polish justice system. She is a co-founder of the Justice Defense Committee and the Free Courts Foundation, both of which monitor and archive political pressure on judges and lawyers, giving them legal aid. She regularly participates in legislative processes in, Poland, in Poland's parliament as an expert in parliamentary constitutional governance and reform of the justice system groups. She also presents on the state of the Polish justice system to the European Commission. Since 2017, Sylvia has led the organization of many demonstrations and protests in defense of the rule of law and repressed judges. Uh, she uh, represents national and sexual minorities, refugees, victims of violence, and police brutality before the courts. She also represents Supreme Court judges before the EU Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights in key proceedings on the independence of courts and justices. Thank you. Thank you, Aniko, for this great introduction. I'm so really grateful that we can have uh, this discussion here at Yale. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to tell about, you know, what is going on in Poland and Hungary and about the resilience of the citizens. Uh, and I can speak for myself and for my country. We have such a great activists like Barada Agnieszka, who is really um, doing a lot in this field. And also, as Bart said, we have many activists, we have also many lawyers working for LGBT rights and uh, they, they're doing an amazing job. I have just this privilege to, to be here and I'm very grateful for that. Just Agnieszka and Bart has covered many issues so far. And I could, you know, if you see my notes, no, it's like seven pages about the LGBT rights in Poland, which says it's a lot to say and situation, it's not, um, it's not good just to add to, but already said about LGBT resolutions. And it's also another form, it's local government family charts. They are not explicitly saying about, uh, they're not against LGBT society or they're not against the LGBT ideologies so called, but what they do is they promote a one concept of the family, which is of course, union between a woman and a man. And also they urge the local governments to withdraw uh, we hold money from the NGOs, local NGOs that actually are helping LGBT um, society. So it's another form, um, uh, another than the LGBT uh, resolutions about uh, free zones. And the impact of those resolutions are really real. That it's there. I mean, where when um, um, Commissioner for Human Rights uh, for uh, European Council is doing, she's doing a. Uh, Every year, she's doing like a memorandum about LGBT uh, rights in in European countries, and she uh, was asking. She investigated this issue, and this is really uh, harmful for LGBT society. She just uh, heard the testimonies that LGBT residents uh, were refused service by local business, for example, in pharmacy. How horrible uh, is that? Of course, our uh, in for activists or artists working on this field, I, as Bart said. Uh, having now claims at the courts, LGBT people being shunned by fellow residents, right? So it's happening. It's it's uh, it's really horrible. Those those things that they're not just only on paper, right? It's the real uh, real uh, impact. Also, just to uh, just to add, but you know, we are quite used to it, unfortunately, in Poland for those uh, of these horrible words, you know, saying being said by the politicians. I would just quote you some because when I uh, quoted that with the Yale students at one of the lectures, they were so shocked. You might not know uh, what they're really saying. For example, uh, Yaroslav Kaczynski, who was a head of Law and Justice Post Party, uh, he says that LGBT ideologies is attack on families and children. It would lead to the sexualization of children. Uh, this is a radical destruction of the moral and cultural order or, uh, Minister Tarnik, who is the Minister of Education now, uh, he says that LGBT people are not equal to normal people. Those are words like that. And for that, Minister Tarnik was, uh, I filed a claim on behalf of one of the uh, professor of the um, university in Warsaw against him. It's now in the court. We will see about that. We are struggling to, we're thinking about new forms of uh, 
of defending LGBT society, because as Bart said, there are no many tools at the table. And of course, uh, as he said, as far as the criminal law is concerned, we don't have uh, in the Polish criminal uh, code uh, any, um, any article that actually prohibits to uh, prohibit hate speech or hate crime on a grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity. There is no such thing. So basically Bart was right. You can tell whatever you want and they're doing that and you don't have any uh, responsibility. And also just to add to this, uh, it's, uh, and Bart and Agnieszka mentioned about it a bit. There's a huge public funding of homophobia. And for example, Minister of Justice, he has this justice fund, which is supposed to be designed for vi victims and witnesses of the crime. And the money from this very fund, it's now went to the program to counteracting offenses involving violations of freedom of conscience committed under influence of LGBT ideology. So they should go to, I know, victims of the crimes, but no, they've created a whole program against LGBT society funded by the Polish um, uh, government. And uh, Bart already mentioned about the role of the Polish church. It's enormous in Poland. Poland is still a very Catholic country. So uh, the, unfortunately, I must say that the Polish Catholic church is very much supporting the government, the politicians uh, in his, their, these horrible words against the, uh, the um, LGBT society. And of course, media and public uh, broadcast uh, another lawsuit, which Bart, he, in this case, is my is my client, but it was very much um, initiated by Agnieszka. That's a coincidence, uh, actually, that you both hear. So one of the newspapers in Poland, believe me or not, they wanted to release so-called um, stickers with LGBT free zones and attach it to the to the newspaper. So uh, what we did together, we uh, obtained a court statement saying no. You can't do it. You have to, you can't do it. This is really, uh, this is a, like, this is a discrimination. Of course, we're not gonna live in a country like that, that any newspaper is allowed to uh, release this kind of uh, stickers. And for the, uh, as far as the legal proceedings has, are concerned, also Polish amb ombudsman has claimed to the court, to the administrative court, those resolutions of uh, of LGBT free zones, I think you, has won most of the cases, right? Saying that they are not, uh, they are not valid. So, but now uh, Adam Bodner is unfortunately no longer an ombudsman, and we will see whether the new one will support LGBT society that much as he did. Uh, we will see about um, about that. Maybe I will just leave the floor to my Hungarian friends. Uh, as I said, I have many uh, notes about it, but maybe something will come up and uh, during our uh, panel discussion. Thank you so much. And yes, let's move on to Hungary because it, it will be very interesting as we shall see that the ideologies are very similar, but the government strategies are very different when it comes to uh, to the oppression or the silencing of the LGBTQ community. And again, uh, some of our American colleagues are truly surprised when they hear the, the extent or the aggressivity with which that's happening. So first I will ask Krista Seke uh, to talk and then Joel Sekesh. So Krista Seke Maybe, started- her Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt. Maybe it's better yes. if you ask Joel first because maybe he can give a more better oversight okay. on the legal and, and yes. I'm gonna be the part two one. That's a great idea, especially because Joat is also approaching this topic from the angle of okay. the law. So why don't we start with Joat and then Krista, okay. you'll conclude the panel. Thank, Thank you, you for the suggestion. So uh, with that said, uh, Joat Sekeres is a senior legal officer of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, one of the country's largest and oldest human rights NGOs. He coordinates the legal work of the HHC, uh, so the Helsinki Committee's refugee program, and is a member of the organization's strategic litigation working group. Joat is actively, uh, I'm sorry, actively engaged in civil society's efforts to tackle the government's anti-LGBTQ rhetoric and legislation. In cooperation with other human rights and LGBTQ associations, Joat helps oversee and helps to oversee and execute the common legal strategy to defend the fundamental rights of LGBTQ people. Apart from his work at the Hung uh, Hungarian Helsinki Committee, Joat is a volunteer lawyer, a uh, lawyer of Budapest Pride. 
In this capacity, he has an active role in defending Pride Month and the march from anti-LGBTQ far right elements. Go ahead, Joel. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. It has been really interesting listening to the experiences of, um, of, of my Polish colleagues, friends, uh, fellow activists. Um, I was taking notes um, uh, ferociously because of course many of the practices that are employed by the Polish government are also employed by the Hungarian government. I think these two governments are um, very eager to influence each other and learn uh, from each other all their best practices and how to suppress um, the, the freedom of thought, the freedom of association and the freedom of, uh, of LGBT people. Hungary, um, of course, has been for a long time after the fall of communism, a model country uh, for, a, for a newly um, forming democracy. It has been referred to as a, as a model to, to aspire to. Uh, and then something changed in, in 2010, uh, increasingly so from 2012 when a new fundamental law, the new constitution entered into force, which already um, entered into force, the drafting of which already um, was not free from anti-LGBT, homophobic and transphobic voices um, before the new constitution of the country, which entered into force in 2012, the, the Hungarian constitution did not explicitly say that marriage is a union between a man and a woman. It said that the Republic of Hungary defends the institution of marriage. The current government, which already controlled um, two thirds of the parliament at the time, just like now, um, therefore they have a constitutional majority to, to amend the constitution, to adopt a new constitution without the need to have the opposition on board. Um, so that party under the premiership of Prime Minister Viktor Orban made it very clear that they want to divert uh, from this ambiguous wording and they made it clear that uh, marriage is a union between a man and a woman, making it a constitutional um, uh, ban on, on same-sex marriage. So that was, I think, already very indicative to, uh, to the Hungarian LGBT community at the time. What is it that we can expect? Under the, um, under the rule of the current government. I remember being in high school at that time and, uh, and we organized a, uh, uh, a petition against the uh, adoption of the new constitution uh, with uh, bloggers on the internet. Um, I was uh, among them and that uh, at the end culminated in a, in a protest together with other civil society actors, um, um, which was attended by uh, by thousands of people. And I think that was also a very um, good occasion when we made it clear that human rights violations suffered by LGBT people uh, or anti-LGBT rhetoric must be understood in a broader context because it is part of the attack on the rule of law, on democracy uh, itself. What you have to understand, I think, and in this aspect, the Hungarian and the Polish governments are very similar, at least sitting in Hungary, that's how Poland looks like to me, is that they thrive on tension. They always need tension because they are not interested, at least the Hungarian government certainly isn't interested in governing the country. They're interested in keeping power for the sake of keeping that power. And in order to do that, they need to be in a constant state of tension, in a constant state of war, practically. The prime minister always um, uses war-like uh, rhetoric um, and, and is uh, firing up his followers in, a, in, a, in their heroic defense of Hungary against Brussels, that is European institutions, against asylum seekers and migrants, and now against LGBT people, or as my Polish friend said, LGBT ideology, LGBT activists who in the imaginary world uh, of the government want to go into schools and corrupt children. It is somehow, you know, always this let's defend children from these very mysterious and then looming LGBT activists who want to turn them gay and then also turn them to the other gender. I mean, it's a very incoherent worldview. But I think what's very dangerous about these populist extreme right-wing governments is that they completely detach themselves also from uh, objective reality um, and are not bound by, uh, by the same rules that I think we try to follow um, when we advocate for the things that we believe in. Um, 
And in Hungary, that took that started taking um, a very serious turn in 2020, when the Hungarian governing majority in parliament passed a law under the first wave of COVID, um, when demonstrations were not allowed due to public health reasons that made it impossible, that practically banned the legal recognition of gender, um, which is, of course, a disaster for transgender people in Hungary. It means that um, in a fortnight, practically, in the, in, the, in the course of two weeks until this law was passed by the parliament and then signed into law uh, by the president of the republic, they were stripped away from the very core of their human dignity, which is to, to have uh, state recognition of their true identity. Um, and that was followed by an increasingly anti-LGBT rhetoric uh, by the government, which um, started becoming more and more frequent. Um, the, the May uh, law on the legal, on the ban on legal recognition of gender was followed by an amendment of the new constitution in December, which again made it clear uh, that in Hungary, in a family, a, man, a father should be a man and the mother should be a woman. Uh, that is because the government wanted to make it clear where they stand on, in their own words, the global war against gender and the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of family. Um, and also practically through an amendment of the constitution and other laws, they made it impossible for um, same-sex couples to adopt uh, children, which as couples, it was already not possible um, under the law previously, um, but um, before the child protection services, um, even if somebody wanted to adopt a child, uh, legally speaking, as, um, as a single individual, uh, it was clear if it was a same-sex couple and the adoption procedure went through based on uh, professional grounds. Now that is no longer possible. And that was followed um, by, a new, by the introduction of a new bill uh, in June this year, which uh, bans the, um, the uh, uh, promotion of homosexuality and change of gender at birth to minors. I mean, the wording of this new legislation, this new law is extremely ambiguous. Um, the sanctions are not clear or there aren't any sanctions. Um, clearly it was meant as, as a tool to create confusion and to have a chilling effect in society, to, to silence people talking about these issues, to silence, uh, to push people back into the closet, to, to not have a discussion on the equal rights of LGBT people, on, on LGBT equality uh, in the name of children and the protection of children, uh, which is just vile, which is just cruel, because what it does practically is that it makes child abuse uh, a state policy. Uh, it is very dangerous exactly against those who are most vulnerable to verbal and physical abuse, um, homophobic and transphobic abuse. Um, and I personally also received um, calls or texts from, from LGBT teens uh, living in the countryside who in smaller communities in villages or small towns tend to be a lot more vulnerable to homophobic and transphobic violence. And of course, people or young people living in Budapest, for example. Um, I was involved, um, I was invited to, to have an informal talk with uh, school counselors a few weeks ago um, who, were, who were worried whether they can continue to, uh, to, to counsel LGBT youth, to turn to them asking their help against abuse, domestic violence, or just want them to tell them that they are okay, that they are not, um, not, not, not um, they, they're not that they're normal human beings, um, and they want to to have affirmation of their their worth as human beings, and they're now unsure whether they can do that without facing uh, consequences or lawsuits. Um, this is um, and this is a tool clearly that the government is using in order to divide society, uh, fire up the far right in order to uh, to win the election that is coming up next year. And the price that they're willing to pay goes as high as the mental health, the psychological well-being, or to the extreme, even the lives of LGBT youth, which is against the very ideas and the core ideas of democracy and the rule of law. We are, of course, fighting back. Um, we're not silent. Um, and um, 
sure we're going to talk about how we do that um, in the panel discussion. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Joel. So I'm just addressing our audience. So feel free to put in your questions into the Q and A uh, section of the Zoom of this Zoom meeting. And while you're doing so, um, we would like to hear from Krista. So let I'll quickly introduce her too. Krista Sika started her uh, theatrical career as a ballerina. After leaving the ballet, she lived uh, two years in Laos and two years in China. Krista enrolled in the theater directing program of the University of Theater and Film of Budapest in 2010. And upon graduation, she joined the world-renowned theater company Katona Jozef Sinhas as a resident director. Since 2021, she has been a member of the theater's artistic board. In 2017, Krista's production of A Doll's House won the Best Production Award at the Hungarian National Theater Festival, the Post. And the same year, she also received the Critics' Choice Best Production Award for her direction of Caucasian's Chalk Circle, as well as the title of the Most Promising Emerging Artist. Krista's work, artistic work is known for her special focus on raising critical questions of our present, often through classical pieces, and on creating a work environment that is characterized by equitable communication between the actors and the creative team, which is quite unique in Hungary. Her 2017 Pride opening speech, in which she strongly criticized the government and the mental state of the Hungarian society, became nationally recognized and made it to the front pages of all major news portals. In 2021, when the government banned all LGBTQ representation from the media, in collaboration with the Hungarian L magazine, she and her partner appeared on the cover page with an image of themselves in a series called One Love. What? Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. It's uh, not easy to say anything original after so many thoughts, but uh, I will try to aim on the artistic angle or my experience as much as I can. Um, the interesting part in Hungary that um, <clears throat> some uh, after the communism, I think um, this society, in a way, just uh, thought switching will be uh, very easy and just like that to democracy. And um, I think there was a huge work that wasn't done uh, in education and in arts. Uh, so the people, the way people are thinking, uh, I think are very mixed up in a way because they suddenly got so much uh, coming from the West and uh, and having this, uh, but what I call the cultural silence. And um, in my work, uh, what I'm trying to uh, do or, or aim is to break this kind of uh, silence. So when I um, graduated from uh, from art school, I was given this uh, huge opportunity to have my diploma piece in Katona, which uh, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't know, but in Hungary, it's uh, it's the lead, one of the leading or or the leading uh, theaters. So it was a big opportunity to enter uh, somehow the cultural stage in, in, in a big way. And for me, uh, I took the chance to do my own version of uh, Petra von Kant, uh, which is uh, an LGBTQ uh, story. We had our own uh, version of the text. And by the by this time, I'm just telling this story because it was in a way long time before all this actually started to happen as fast as it's happening now. Uh, <clears throat> so I had my diploma production and it it blew up in a in 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 a bad way and in a good way too. So I'm just saying that even uh, already uh, staging um, two women in love uh, on a, in a major theater caused um, a big wave of everything. So that showed me that the Hungarian um, uh, society 
silence is is um, needs to be broken. Uh, but there was no. Uh, that was just the beginning of uh, of of companies and directors um, starting to take uh, LGBTQ topics as something uh, that it needed to be on stage. And shortly after uh, this happened in Katona, there was another another uh, production which I didn't do but uh, uh, Bela Pinter did. Uh, and that was the time when the Hungarian government started this thing so-called uh, culture cleansing, which means that they begin to uh, basically wipe out all uh, theaters all around the country. Um, they really controlled who gets money to make films, who gets uh, money to eat and be a painter. So everything uh, changed very fast. And uh, the stake of a theater to, to stage what they want was, it had, it had uh, the possibility that the theater gets shut down. And uh, Bela Pinte in Katona did this production which was uh, based uh, on a story of uh, one of the lead leader politicians of Fidesz, uh, a major, a mayor of a um, uh, big city in Hungary, whose uh, wife left him uh, for a woman. So the government uh, tried to make everything to stop tabloids and all the news to this to come out. And they, in a way, stopped it. But there was a there was a play that was written, had a very similar story, and Katona showed this, and um, and they almost shut down the theater. They uh, cut our budget to the half. They called the whole committee into the mayor's office and. Um, and threatened us that there was our last uh, last shot. So this is just a story, just to maybe give a glimpse of the atmosphere that is uh, going on in the in the artistic uh, world. Um, uh, this last uh, turn of the so-called child protection law that is actually um, giving no sense of what exactly we supposed to do or not to do uh, creates an incredible uh, fear for all uh, theaters and artists. Um, just to say another example again, that uh, this law uh, came out and there was a huge uh, movement uh, front of the parliament and uh, I gave a speech and uh, very very soon in collaboration with Elle magazine we did this cover shooting uh, with my partner and uh, another uh, gay couple I have it here I'll show it to you maybe it's a little fun because I think it's a pretty picture Uh, so it was a huge uh, thing. It was a huge gesture from Elle magazine because they took the chance of a huge uh, fine and an aggressive wave. Uh, in a way, it was uh, yeah a big, a huge thing for us too because my partner is a very well-known Hungarian actress and now is the only Hungarian <laughs> actress that is actually out. But the next day, when I had uh, when when this came out, I had a, a pre-production meeting in um, in a theater on the countryside because uh, for some time now I had the feeling that I should not only work in Budapest, where I think that I work in a bubble 
and I I am having a conversation with people who who agree with me. So I I took a job in uh, Mishkoat, which is the second I think the second largest city in Budapest, but in the east part of the country, which is incredibly uh, poor. I was driving uh, there to to get to my production meeting through villages, uh, villages that are so poor that you cannot imagine. I think I couldn't imagine, uh, even though I I believed to this point that I'm following uh, certain documentaries and certain uh, news about uh, this region, but I was driving through. I saw kids, uh, not even without shoes, but uh, having their feet wrapped in plastic bags. That was their shoes, and uh, having the government's huge uh, boards everywhere around the village, uh, and then really emphasizing that you, you could see that these people need food and they need water and they need, uh, and I'm saying this the nicest possible way, education of, of, uh, of really basic kinds. You, as I pass by, you have this image and you see these uh, billboards saying, uh, don't you want to protect your children uh, from transvestites? Uh, they even using the terms many times uh, in a wrong way. They don't even know who, who, who we need to be protected from, but it's a very strong image uh, driving through a village like this. And, and uh, instead of really caring for these people, uh, threatening them that there's gonna be uh, a transvestite in the bush jumping out and operate their children because basically this is this is the message and uh, so I went following the story and I'm going to be over, over soon uh, following up the story is um, is I arrived to this theater and it was five days after this law went through and I entered the pre-production pre meeting and uh, and I didn't even say anything or show anything of what I want. Uh, the director of the theater, knowingly who I was, already uh, smashed the table and said, there will be no, no gay stuff here. There will be no gay characters in this show. There will be no this, no that, and, but in a very harsh way. Uh, it really, made me think for the first time that I should probably pack up and leave. Uh, and I said, okay, there will be a gay character in this show. And there, of course, I will not censor myself. I will do whatever I want. And then you come in, you take my production and you yourself can uh, take out whoever you want from this show or redirect uh, in a way you want. So um, it's very hard to get everything together because I also want to say, and, and, uh, and this is just the really, for me, it's the worst feeling about all this, that I just have the feeling that we are all victims of, uh, of a power game and that uh, there is, that I am myself as an artist and as an activist, I am myself is dragged to a stage that is uh, built not especially and and against uh, LGBTQ people, or yes, of course it is, but it is there to to give them power. And if it's very hard for me to find the good way to enter and the good way to stay away from this because I don't want to be a puppet because I feel that that if I don't find as an artist a good good uh, volume then I'm just I'm just a puppet that is that is used by them and and I, I'm just an example that you see she's doing it again it's there again 
if there's nothing else you can talk about. Um, so as an artist, it's a very confusing time to work in Hungary and, and uh, the channels of uh, free art are, are narrowed down and it's getting more and more narrow every day. Thank you so much. I know much. this was a little bit fluffy, but. <laughs> no, that's actually great because we did want to go from here to a little bit to your own personal experiences and how, because there are, the, there are these different laws that are happening around us and there are these, diff and there is a sort of a media sanction or national media sanctioned hate uh, that, that is being sort of like enforced on people. And I'm really thankful actually that both Agnieszka and Yuki, so you kind of emphasize that, it, that it's, it's, it's part of a larger hate uh, narrative and it's part of a larger uh, xenophobia, xenophobia, of course. But, but then of course, uh, today here, here we are zooming in on what's specifically happening with the LGBTQ community. And so, so one of the next questions that I was going to have was actually going to be a little bit about like how you personally experience this, like these, these ideologies that are sort of like happening surrounding, surrounding you and, and, the, and what are some of the ways in which you can successfully, you feel that you can successfully fight back. Uh, but for the sake of time, since we only have like 20 -ish minutes left, I will turn to the questions now, but I will ask you what I will ask you to do that in your answers, if, uh, if you could, again, like speak from per personal experience to you too, if you feel comfortable, and also uh, speak of representation. So I'd be really curious to hear that what Krista was describing in Hungary, how it has become a risk actually to, to include LGBTQ representation into an artwork, into a library. We've, we've heard the most horrific story is that um, what's happening in Poland. But let me first read uh, the question uh, by Edgar Piedharita Torres, and then just feel free to take the question whoever feels the most uh, ready to answer. Uh, and I will ask this question for both countries, actually. How do activists analyze the recent results of the survey that has been run by the CBOs of the Solian in Poland regarding the Polish social attitudes towards homosexuality and equal marriage? Do you guys see any progress? What is really hindering Poland to pass same-sex same marriage bill? Do you think political actors in the civic platform party are really engaging in this issue? What else should or can be done? And same question about same-sex marriage in Hungary. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Sorry, um, I wasn't sure if it's addressed to me. Uh, I was, you know, I was living um, in States practically all time in 90s. Uh, so I was able to observe the huge change which happened in um, American society um, concerning the um, LGBT and no one, spoke in this time LGBT, it was like gay laws uh, and, um, the, um, and, and freedoms. And um, I think that um, part of this big change um, was due to the um, activity of um, uh, audiovisual narration, uh, movies and especially series and especially popular series. Uh, of course, AIDS played paradoxical role in that, and I'm not speaking about the, the activism of um, LGBT, um, LGBT um, um, activists and, um, and supporters. Uh, I'm speaking um, about the change which happened in the public opinion and which was much broader and larger than any kind of the activism can allow in such a short um, amount of time. Um, some studies have been made um, in Mexico, which is a very homophobic uh, society, as uh, you know, uh, as you know, um, and um, uh, the change after some particular um, shows um, uh, was amazing. The change in in the in the in the, in the public uh, Mexican opinion. Uh, so I believe that it can have, or at least um, in the past, um, it had. A very important impact, and um, um, more popular was uh, was the show, uh, which was in, in, in portraying the LGBT people as uh, neighbors, brothers, um, fathers, whoever, 
the effect of that was bigger. Um, so um, I really believe that, um, especially in American society, um, the audiovisual narration can change the attitude and the opinions um, of the people. If it's enough of that, I don't know. Um, I, I think that it is very present subject in, um, in the movies and um, in the series and the big platforms and also um, the cables are giving quite a lot of space um, to, the, to this issue and to the diversity altogether. And um, after Me Too, um, diversity and equality issue became much broader and uh, concerned not only the subjects um, and content, uh, but also the production. It means um, uh, it is necessary to have uh, the practically all minorities plus women um, who are majority, but are not treated like, like such um, in, the, in the production of the movies and series. So um, I, I, I see here that the mm, filmmaking and television um, society is it's, it's doing quite a lot um, in this regard. And even in Poland, which, uh, which is so homophobic and which is officially, uh, officially homophobic, you can see um, several movies. With the, with the television, it's, it's not so easy, but with the movies, it's much easier. Uh, which represent in very honest and courageous way the, the problems and, um, and situation of this community. And yes, I think that it helps, but in the same time, without political fight and activist fight, nothing is changing. It, ha it has to go together. And the artistic tools, um, theater, television, and uh, movies, and uh, literature uh, are extremely powerful tool, but it will never be enough to use only this one. And when Bart was talking about the change among young generation due to Netflix and, and VOD and so on, it is true that I, I don't think that is the only reason that they are watching those series and movies, but the, the, the new generation in Poland, the young generation is very different. It means um, equality and uh, diversity. It, they are quite natural to them and they are important subject, important um, um, element in the life, uh, which creates some hope, but unfortunately hope for me, it's not big enough because um, due to the uh, demographic um, situation in Poland, uh, this young, uh, this young generation represents um, about 6% of the voters. Uh, and the, so somehow they cannot win. That which I, I think as a, in the, in the, on the civilization ground, um, it, is, it is something which is terrible, you know, that the future of, um, of, the, of the youth is decided by the old farts. And it will be like that for years and years, except if we start to, 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 uh, to change the demographic, which I don't think is gonna happen, especially with the anti-women laws, which are, which are, which are taken in uh, by, the, by the government. Uh, but um, uh, you wanted me to tell something also about my experience. My experience, I have some personal, I have some personal experience with the subject and this, um, it explains partly why I'm so sensitive to it. First, um, I was studying in, 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 in communist Czechoslovakia and the growing and after working in communist Poland and um, the um, gay community was practically totally non-official, it was totally underground. And my close, two closest friends, one in Prague and another in Warsaw, have been homosexuals. And I was, um, I was, I was very close to them in, on all levels. And I was able to observe and to live with them the situation of somebody who, is, um, who doesn't have the rights to, to express, not only to express, but to even show to his family who he really is and who he really loves. Um, and um, something which broke my heart, it was when the, my Warsaw friend died in the car accident. 
Um, and uh, on his funeral, his lover, his the closest man, person to him, uh, was not allowed by the family to be even close to his coffin. So, uh, and after afterward, my, my daughter um, told me that she's lesbian and uh, I somehow knew it already, but she told me when she fell in love for the first time. And, um, and uh, so I had to think about her future and her situation. And uh, of course I met after, um, also when you are a filmmaker, when you are an artist, you are meeting, um, you are meeting LGBT people practically on daily basis because that is uh, the community where um, this, um, this um, minority is um, um, represented in, 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 in on very big scale. Uh, so yeah, it is important issue to me, and I think that it shows not only the state of the of the democracy, but the state of the humanity. And the young people in Poland right now, especially when they are not from Warsaw or a big city, they are they are suffering in the way which is impossible to accept especially that this propaganda is entering their families and their parents are unable to accept their own children uh, because they believe that their orientation represents some unpardonable, how to say, that they are not really fully human. And, um, and that uh, this attitude of the of the of the of the parents, it's not something which we can reduce to few percent or even not half of the population. I think that eighty percent of of um, of uh, fathers um, don't accept homosexual children. So um, it is for me the, the because I am a parent of of homosexual uh, homosexual uh, woman. It is for me especially difficult to understand and to accept. And I'm blaming, yes, I'm blaming the state propaganda and the especially church propaganda for that. Um, so this fight against this propaganda is something which, um, uh, which, we, have to, um, which we have to do um, all together. The activists and uh, the supporters and um, all citizens who feel that um, uh, this um, incredible injustice has to be repaired. Thank you. Yes, and uh, uh, I know. So, so Joel, uh, I'll just pass the baton on you for, to you first in a second. But what I would like to ask uh, all of you to comment on, especially as we are kind of like uh, approaching the end of this session, is again going back to the personal experiences. I'm really wondering that. So. Um, for instance, what you mentioned that there is a reason for optimism that we are slowly winning, as I'm quoting you, and then Krista, you um, shared this um, pretty ter terrifying story with us about Mishkot. But I would I would be really curious to hear if you like to what extent uh, are people willing to stand up for like st stand up against these ideologies? So to, so for instance, Bart, when you're going to the countryside. Um, what is what is the reception there? And Krista, same question to you about when you find yourself in a situation like this, was there anyone who would have approached you after that meeting that, oh gosh, that, that's just terrifying. And then as, and then I'm and then sort of like translating this struggle into the sphere of law, I'm very curious that as, as you are pushing back in the legal arena, do you feel like that you're fighting politicians or that you're fighting so, the society? And of course, it's really hard to sort of make this distinction, but uh, something that our students always want to know, and of course that I myself want to know is, is, is what is the feeling of this? Like how, 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 how much do you experience and perceive allyship in society? And go ahead, Joel. Thank you very much. As to the question of whether we are winning, um, I very much agree that we are winning and we will eventually win. Uh, the only question that I have is that at what cost are we going to win? Uh, one year ago, I was speaking at a panel uh, with, um, with, with um, Hungarian activists on the then recently adopted legal ban on the recognition of gender, where I said that 
very optimistically at the time, don't worry, this piece of legislation is going to end up where it belongs in the dustbin of history and it will be all just a bad memory, it's a human rights virus and we are going to defeat it the same way as we will eventually get a COVID vaccine. And then one transgender activist um, um, very correctly um, then intervened and said, yeah, but how many lives uh, is that going to take? How many futures are going to be broken until we get there? And I think that is the essential question. We are going to win at the European Court of Human Rights in each case that we bring there. Um, we are going to eventually win at the Hungarian Constitutional Court. We're going to, it, I, I don't, I cannot imagine from my professional standpoint or view um, that these kind of legal restrictions could test, could stand the test uh, of, uh, of, of the human rights regimes that were put in place to build up European democracies. But then again, that was never the aim or that was never the purpose. Uh, of these laws. And as for me personally, um, the aim is, is kind of twofold. On the one hand, it is of course to, to help, um, and the Helsinki Committee is helping fight these battles also to, to protect in a wider scope the, uh, the rule of law and democracy in Hungary. Uh, but I think we also have a very important role in keeping the flame of, of democracy and human dignity alive in society. Um, I think in, under the weight of, of these oppressive laws, it can be very easy for people, especially isolated young people uh, in vulnerable situations to feel that they are alone, and we have to show them that they are not alone. Uh, and that's why for me personally, it was um, very inspiring to see at the demonstration that Krista mentioned when I was also one of the speakers, there were so many young people turning up, 10,000 young people turned up outside of parliament who are normally, I think, very hard to engage in the political discourse um, to demonstrate. That's why I think the actions of, um, of, of Krista, for example, are very important when, when you didn't let yourself be bullied uh, into, into censorship. And um, what we try to say at the Helsinki Committee uh, is that everybody can find their own ways of, of activism in society. You don't have to be a lawyer, you don't have to be a director in order to, to have a positive impact on society. Um, you, just, you just find whatever suits you most. The key here is that we don't stay silent uh, and we don't abandon each other um, in this fight uh, because that is essential. Uh, and I think in this, um, no matter what they write in the law, um, the superior legal norms, um, the, the basic morality that is the, the supporting structure of human rights is on our side. And that is why um, what the Elle magazine did, for example, that Krista showed, uh, what uh, TV channels, some TV channels in Hungary are doing, what um, content providers are doing, and very importantly, what those brave teachers, psychologists, and social workers, parents, and friends are doing, who are not letting themselves to be silenced, they are really carrying this torch, this flame, um, to, to they're, they are keeping it alive, uh, so that not, uh, so that um, maybe not that many people will have to break uh, until these laws will be a sour memory of the past. Thank you. And, and let me quickly ask Sylvia here because the the court situation is so distinct in in Poland at the moment. So could you could you speak to this a little bit? And also, um, also if you if you share the optimism that uh, Joel was just kind of outlining us that there's going to be a law that's going to eventually protect. Well, uh, I do share, yeah, thank you. I do share the optimist. Uh, for our audience, it may be very uh, awkward that we said all those horrible things about the situation of the country, but yet we are all optimistic. And I fully agree with, uh, with the diagnosis that Bart said. It's the different generation, it's, uh, it's common, it has to change. And as far as the legal proceedings are concerned, I just wanna say that there are a lot of lawyers in Poland who devoted their life legal life, you know, legal work to work for so-called rainbow families. And we have many proceedings in the European Court of Justice um, in Strasbourg. Unfortunately, they're waiting, they're like, 
I think 11 years, some of them about the same sex marriage, which is bad, but I do think we're gonna win them one day. Once finally the European Court of Human Rights will find this courage to take care of this uh, of these cases because now it's not doing that. So really we're not get, getting a lot of support from this uh, part, from, from, from the tribunal. But you know, just to give you an example for, for the American audience, for example, you know, in European Union, uh, a couple from Poland can get married, I don't know, in Germany, in Berlin, and they come to Poland. And it's nothing they can do now, for example, to recognize this in their papers. So technically, you can be married to a man in Germany, but you can just come to Poland and, you know, and marry to a woman because there is no legal mention in the act. So this is the, the same with children, right? So uh, those are real problems of uh, real people, and we really working on that and uh, about the question about strategic litigations. Uh, so it always has two levels. One is against, of course, the system and the government. And you do that to change the system and it may take a lot of time, as I said. But the other part is also about the society. Do you send the message? I'm not gonna tolerate that as a citizen, as a lawyer, this is what I'm gonna do. And I'm gonna wait and uh, work as long as it takes to make that happen. And uh, I fully um, agree that everyone, you know, can help just stay informed, speak up, become an ally. I fully agree with that, but I have a special message. That's my last sentence for the young lawyers, because when I meet you now here at Yale, or at, you know, Western University, you're so uh, much into the helping the society to work for others, for work for the good cause. Don't lose that, please don't lose that, just don't get too comfortable with your regular work, with having a nice job, with a nice law firm, because people like, you know, Bart, uh, Agnieszka, you know, all my Hungarian friends, they really need you and need your help. And you as a lawyer, you have all the tools to help them. So stay, uh, stay, you know, uh, aware of what is going on. Don't lose that once you enter the real life with, with a uh, real job. But could you just Pick up, pick it up from here. Yeah, I'm tot I totally agree with everybody. So let's stay in this hope because uh, Stonewall uh, happened uh, and we know the result that came after many, many years. We need to know that uh, equal rights will not be granted to, uh, to, to us. We need to fight for them. And this is how it's usually work in the history. And actually we see the history on our eyes on our own eyes in Poland, that we are fighting for it. And actually on the long distance run uh, as a marathon, I see that we are winning. Um, Krista, anything to add about your personal experiences about how you experience this like existing in this society, especially after the cover came out? Um. I think just I had this idea, which I really want want to add, is that I have the Hungarian society. I think itself is not as a total. It's not homophobic. We don't have. Uh, you're not traditionally homophobic. So I think that um, what happened here that uh, this slow step the government took. Uh, before this uh, big gesture that became very loud uh, with the cover and with the, with the parliament in front of the parliament movement and that just really fired up society. I don't think that anyone really cared or really understood uh, what, is, what is going on. And when this, uh, when this sentence, uh, <clears throat> entered that uh, the mother should should be a woman, the father, mother is a woman, father is a man. I don't even get it really, what what they really want. <laughs> what is what is the message here? Uh, I, I, I sometimes it, I, it pops into my mind and I just, what, what's the meaning of this? Anyway, so people didn't really know what's the meaning of this. I didn't even know what's the meaning of this, but this child protection law just really blew up and it caused a huge wave of sympathy uh and and of course it caused uh some hate talk 
on the internet and I'm sure many, many difficult situations or situations like mine, which actually ended in a way good. But I just want to emphasize that I I think that that Fidesz is not really aiming to a good point here in Hungary because the Hungarians don't don't really have this. They're xenophobic. So the migrant uh, refugee card was great, really. It just it was it was perfect, and that was the first time that when I opened the Pride. I didn't really talk about the LGBTQ people. I I basically talked about the refugees because I I just had the feeling that that uh, the Hungarian society is more uh, xenophobic than homophobic, and uh, therefore I, I I have the feeling that they blew this up and then this huge sympathy wave came, uh, and now it's it's quieter now it's they they really step back they are not really sure how to how they going to navigate from this uh, from this point so therefore i'm optimistic and i and i completely agree with the youth we are uh, a rainbow family we are raising uh, a, a teenager a young teenager uh, boy um so i was i was the first time i have had this shock and it's a different kind of shock because uh, well, I don't know, but uh, probably he is not gay. So if he's not a gay kid in school bullied, but he is he's a kid who have uh, not common, uh, fam- not not the Hungarian uh, great family, but a different kind of family. So I was, I was for 24 hours. I was shocked how he's gonna. I don't know what's gonna happen to him next day at school, and. Uh, but some some days later, they they were here with with some friends, like teenage boys, and uh, and they they really they're watching Netflix and they're watching uh, Euphoria and and series like this. And we had a conversation with them, and they just don't get it. And they are ten something, and they just don't get it. What 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 they want with this and um and and they were making kind of a joke trying to form um a letter word for for heterosexual sexual activities like why why just why just lgbtq then why not to find something so their angle is so different and there is something and i also can relate that it's also there will be uh there will be families and there will be situations and probably of course outside of this bubble when 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 parents who are uncertain and parents who care about their neighbor's opinion and parents who care about uh or they don't know the answer. They don't know how to answer when when a child uh, is different. There will be really, really hard and uh, and challenging times. But I am, I am. I have. We have to be optimistic because if if you're not optimistic, if you don't believe that there there is something you can achieve, and there you don't believe that, then you cannot be part of this uh, change. And um, I just want to say that for everyone, that everything matters. It's not only the activists and and the, the artists, the lawyers, it's everyone. It's uh, everyone's neighbor, it's everyone's kid, it's everyone's friend, or, or uh, it's just a comment you decide to make or not to make or a different comment to make to your situation. So we we are together on this. And uh, and and of course, and I also agree with uh, with that idea that we have to go through with this. It, um, it, it's probably these countries will also have to walk this way of uh, equality and freedom. But it's everyone in everyone's hand. It's not no no one can uh, sit back and and wait 
for the miracle, but because there are uh, no miracles like this. Thank you so thank you. much, and, and thank you, thank you to all of you. And I do think that Krista, what you just said in the end, it's something that I personally believe that in in uh, Hungary is just um, it is a challenge to to learn that we always have to speak up for each other. That is just so important. Again, as you said, it's not, not even without a platform, just within the smallest communities. And uh, so that's a great way to end this panel. And um, we are very very thankful at Yale that you all could join us. Um, we didn't get to all of the questions, but I feel that most of what you said related to the, the audience's questions. So um, I hope that I hope that everyone sort of leaves with some answers to, to the questions that were in the Q&A section. And again, uh, thank you and, and have a great evening. Have a great day. It was great to have all of you here. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All the best to our Hungarian friends. Yes. All the yeah. best to you too. All the best to you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.